It's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers of the symposium, the Humanities Research Center and the School of Art at ANU, the Research School of Humanities and the Arts, in collaboration with the curatorial and educational services of the NGA. And to also thank the centenary of Canberra that's kindly assisted with bringing me here. It's my first visit to Australia. It's incredibly exciting and I'm really impressed with everything I've seen and the people I've met. And it's next on to Sydney. It's a pleasure too to be asked to give such a prestigious lecture and I hope I can do justice to these big issues in this big talk. So here we go. My background is as an art historian. Um, I've been curating art in the public realm since the late 1970s, so my role has developed as one of strategist and policymaker and producer of public art. As the senator said, a broker of collaborations and also an initiator of projects, both temporary and permanent. Now, in addressing some of the current challenges and controversies in public arts today, I shall use examples and case studies, including those of my own office, modus operandi, and many others, presented in categories representative of some of the current strands in public art today, including older examples. To paraphrase Karl Marx, those who don't study history are condemned to repeat it, and this is particularly true of public art. My standpoint is inevitably one from a highly overcrowded and tiny UK and a Western European perspective. So forgive me for that, um, albeit informed by international research. And I'll finish briefly with a case study on the BBC and mention the Radcliffe Project in Oxford. So to start, who is commissioning what are they commissioning and why are they commissioning it? So today's patrons of public art, in the Renaissance, of course, it would have been largely been the state and the church, as well as sponsors and companies such as the Medici, the great families of the day. And here, of course, we see the, the wide diversity of everyone who is commissioning, which would be familiar to many of you. The scope of what is being commissioned, of course, is very broad indeed and ranges from land art, site-specific work which seeks to decommodify the artwork, right through to artists' initiatives and interventions, including participatory art. Now, public art is, of course, as broad as artists' imaginations allow. And these categories are often contradictory. They're very diverse. In the past three decades, there have been changes of fashion terminology and areas of activity from the purchased standalone sculpture, the space invader, to the site-specific sculpture, from the integration of site-related and site-generated art within architecture and landscape to artist-designed places and environments, which we'll be looking at from the temporary intervention to interdisciplinary collaboration. At the same time, artists are working, as they have done post-Second World War, in participatory practice from situationism, fluxus and community arts right through to what's called participatory art and relational art and social practice today. All this alongside research-based projects and artists' residences, books, web-based projects, and journeys. Why people commission is, of course, a question that we always ask those who wish to commission, those who have the funding to commission. And these, too, can be competing motives that have to be resolved. One of our jobs is to ensure that everybody is lined up facing in the same direction when commissioning. Are they celebrating, commemorating, decorating, regenerating? You know, what is the motive behind the commission, or, or does it simply stem from the necessary application of percent for art and meeting planning consent? Equally, it might be a community initiative that starts 
the commissioning process off. Or it might be the initiative of an architect or other public realm designer. Or is it the curator or commissioning agency, or indeed the artists themselves who initiate that process? And if it's the artists, how can we support such artist-led visions and as well as those of curators and commissioners? So the scene is very complex. As you will have gathered, it's a field which is riven with controversies. And I'd like to present some of these key issues and challenges outlined in pink, um, both ideological and practical, through a series of aphorisms. These are designed to stimulate discussion rather than intended to be negative. My role is, of course, one of agent provocateur at this conference. I have to raise questions. I hope there'll be much debate over the next two days. And perhaps some of these issues will be addressed. But public art is a field that's riven by these contrasting ambitions. Quality is often a problem. The quantity of public, public art is not necessarily a sign of cultural health. The term public artist, I believe, can be problematic. There's nothing wrong with the term artist. And percent for art is something that is frequently abused. Is it something that's eliciting a too little, too late approach, or is it a useful baseline budget? The term public space, some people feel is an oxymoron because it's a highly contested zone riven with social and legal exclusions. It can be public space for those who might be the right color with the right behavior. Um, equally meaningful public consultation is scarce. Some communities, of course, suffer from over-consultation and consultation fatigue. Equally, communities are consulted about public art, um, but not necessarily about architecture and public space. But it's public art that comes under the microscope, that comes under the lens. Contracts don't always sufficiently protect artists' rights. Um, there's a current case of an artwork, a sculpture that has been copied in China. Uh, when it comes to deaccessioning public art, it is the commissioners who are privileged rather than the artists. Media coverage fuels public hostility, as we know, um, it, and of course they assist newspaper sales. Informed criticism is rare, and that's because most art critics usually feel safer in galleries and at art fairs rather than art in the public realm. And very often most coverage, critical coverage of public art is in the architectural and landscape press. Now leaving some of these contentious issues aside for revisiting later, let's consider, as we're now onto visual gratification of images, you'll be pleased to hear. Let's consider today's scope of public art. Now, the expanded field of public art in the past 30 years has led to it becoming mainstream, of course. It's no longer a fringe activity. Um, but we see here some, or I'd like to start, is public initi um, sorry, artist-initiated projects. And the important thing about this area of work is that, of course, public art is highly controlled. Um, yet there is this incredibly rich strand of artists' initiatives and it's very healthy, uncommissioned, guerrilla street art. And examples such as this work, which was commissioned in 1986 in the city of Oxford um, by a radio presenter, Bill Heiner. And it was erected on the 41st anniversary of the atomic bomb in Nagasaki. It was extremely controversial when it appeared, as you can imagine, the neighbors complained. Um, <laughs> the planners, um, in a stroke of genius, in my view, allowed it to remain, and it still remains in situ today, and indeed it's been conserved relatively recently. So it's become a local landmark. Now, street art is alive of, and well, of course, and examples include the work of Banksy, the UK 
street artist and JR. The irony of this is that although it's non-commissioned and it is a gift by the artist in a sense to the neighborhood, it's now become part of the art market and we find that these works are being chiseled out of walls and are being sold at art auctions internationally. JR, photographer, French photographer, working with communities here in Rio de Janeiro, literally giving new visibility and identity to the locality in a series of astonishing photo-based works. Again, non-commissioned, but part of a dialogue between an artist and a community. And Rachel Whiteread's house, which in East London in 1993 uh, arose for three months. The artist here selected the middle of a terrace of houses and cast the interior space of this domestic house. It was a project on a temporary license from the local authority. Such was the success of house that Rachel Whiteread run, won the prestigious Turner Prize and a lobby for it to remain arose. The London Borough of Tower Hamlets stuck, however, to the original agreement to demolish the house at the end of the agreed period, but it remains firmly in the memory and in documentation, and its 20-year anniversary is this year. Now, artists' desire in the 20th century to work beyond the gallery, as it were, decommodifying their artworks originated in the land art movement post Second World War, as ex exemplified in the work of Robert Smithson, Robert Morris, Nancy Holt, Michael Heiser, and others, and not least, of course, James Tyrrell. And you have here in Canberra a superb example of James Tyrrell's work, which I had the pleasure of seeing this morning. Agnes Dennis in New York in the early 1980s seized urban territory when in, the, in advance of Battery Park City being built, which of course was a big land infill project, planted an area of wheat field, harvested the crop, ground the wheat, made flour and bread and sold it, all unbeknown to the developers. A comment on the intensive developments to follow. And in the 1990s in the UK, the French artist Pierre Vivant, whilst artist in residence at the University of Warwick created his field pieces made in England, commenting on the intensive farming methods being carried out by the Royal Agricultural Society of England. These works, too, are carried out by stealth and exist only in the memory and in documentation. Now, sculpture, when we think, many of us, about public art, sculpture tends to spring to mind. Um, it's possibly the most controversial form of public art today. Um, being freestanding, of course, it can be an, a target um, for negativity. Yet its role as landmark and gateway marker meeting point is still remarkably potent. When formulating plans for landscaping of towns, the urban designer Kevin Lynch coined the generic landmark gateway trail and neighborhood phraseology, apposite guidance indeed for many public art strategies today. Anish Kapoor's Cloud Gate in Chicago's Millennium Park performs two of those functions as gateway and landmark, flattering um, Chicago's inhabitants in its amazing architecture and its shiny stainless steel surface, both convex and concave. Nearby, Jama Plentz's fountain, the Crown Fountain, called after its sponsors, is both sculpture and place, with its two towers bearing videos of Chicagoans. And the artist invites us to walk on water, um, his own dream, as he cannot swim. Animating the journey along a freeway, Simeon Nelson's desiring machine um, outside Melbourne is one of four very well-curated artworks which calibrate the East Link um, in that part of the city. So I mention this um, as a very comparatively recent example and is, of course, a brilliant um, precedent for artworks that notate and calibrate transport systems. And now, 
In Britain, of course, we have freestanding sculpture too of many different kinds. In this case, sculpture's capacity to change the space around it and to make the familiar unfamiliar is very much the case with the fish device sculpture which we commissioned with the Serpentine Gallery in London. Um, these two enormous rocks are balanced one on top of the other. They're not pinned. So this was an artist-engineer collaboration. Now, of course, the scale of sculpture is such an issue, and not least in today's news, the balloon, the scale of the balloon, the cost of the balloon is very, is very much an issue. In the example of the Angel of the North, um, this was a hugely controversial work. Before it was placed, once it was in situ, it sank quickly into the popular imagination. And even those who didn't like it appreciated the fact that it had supported local skills and materials in its fabrication. So it contributed to urban renewal. Scale, of course, even on a tiny scale, can be equally controversial. Here it was the cost of the Tracy Emin tiny sparrow cast in bronze in Liverpool, 25,000 pounds, which hit the headlines. This monument to a bird has become big in the popular imagination, however. In London's Docklands, um, an example of a highly popular work which has been subject to contractual difficulties recently. You see here the traffic light tree by Pierre Vivant, he of the field pieces. Now here, because the developer decided to change the usage of the site, this work, which has been voted several times, one of the most popular artworks in Europe, has been put into storage and it has not yet been reinstalled. So contracts still mitigate in favor of the commissioner in this respect. This work too by Richard Serra could be subject to removal and relocation. It's in Broadgate in London. And again, because the site is changing, this work which is site specific may have to move. We have warned the new owners of the land, uh, British land, that if they want a tilted arc type legal place on their hands, this could be the right way of going about it. So we wait to see what happens with the Richard Serra Fulcrum, which is one of London's major landmarks in contemporary sculpture terms. Of course, however strong or weak the contract, uh, it is very difficult to mitigate against bad taste. And at the whim of London and Continental Railways, this sculpture was commissioned by direct invitation without any expert advice that was rejected. And it is widely derided by the art community and many others. It pales, however, into insignificance in terms of bad taste um, when compared with Damien Hirst's recent verity for Ilfracum. This is a work on 20-year loan um, from the artist. It's meant to represent a modern allegory of truth and justice. And it has been said by contemporary critics that Damien Hirst has brought public art to a new low. And when you have an attention-seeking artist in an ambitious town, you end up with this monstrosity. So we are not immune from <laughs> bad sculpture in Britain. In fact, no country is. It does uh, also beg the question of the, the ambitions and of commissioning and also the points in an artist's brief. In that case, however, there was no brief. It was simply on loan. In the Renaissance, the contracts used to have a clause in about beauty. And the phrase, comme c'est bello si pour, the artist had to make the work as beautiful as he could. It usually was a he. Um, but in the Renaissance, one could argue there was much more a shared concept of beauty at the time. I did try introducing beauty into one or two contracts, and it was questioned as a notion by both commissioner and by artist, beauty according to whom. 
moving on in sculpture towards the Olympic event, and as of course the premier international sporting event, um, cultural Olympiads have spawned amazing programs of art. Uh, there was a very successful one in Sydney, of course, and in Barcelona, where it was more the unofficial program that uh, was successful rather than the official program. And in Beijing, um, works were commissioned, of course, and this was probably the highest profile, the collaboration between Ai Weiwei and the architects Herzog de Meuron. In London, however, we had a very mixed approach um, to curatorship on what one can only describe as a d divide and rule basis. At the arts unit uh, within the Olympic office invited curators to bid for organizing particular artworks throughout the site, so there was no curatorial overview. And in the middle of all this was dropped uh, our mayor's whim um, which is a huge sculpture and lookout point and restaurant by Anish Kapoor entitled Orbit. It was funded by the steel magnate Mittal. And I believe it's unsuccessful both as a sculpture and as a lookout point and as a restaurant. <laughs> I'm afraid, you know, I'm a fan of um, many of Anish Kapoor's works, but um, I do not believe he himself is happy with this, with this work. We were successful in winning three projects. I'll show two of them here. One was by Monica Bonvicini, which was a sculpture for outside the handball arena, um, which is the second largest scale work on the Olympic site, <laughs> about 25 feet in height, so not huge compared with orbit. But interesting choice of typeface, I believe, by the artist, this very um, mute and restrained choice of typeface, which would have been very different had she chosen an italic, of course. And we also commissioned Carsten Nikolai with a, a modest and ethereal sculptural fence, the colors extrapolated from those of the Olympic rings. Now, artists design places, moving through these ways in which artists are working publicly today, because there's some very rich examples to, to witness here. Whilst one can argue that sculpture creates space and place, as well as being per, on occasion a space invader, there's been a distinct move on the part of some artists and public art programs to work with the public realm, the spaces between buildings, which have been classically more ignored by architects. They've been the realm of landscape architects and planners. An early example, um, Bruce um, Nauman's, I'll just flick on to that, the Bruce Nauman Square Depression created finally in 2007, 30 years after it had been designed for Munster, that great sculpture program, which only happens every 10 years. And interestingly here described by Rosalind Krauss as not sculpture, stroke sculpture, not architecture. So it's neither one thing nor the other. It was about the formal qualities of space and the vanishing point. And at the same time, it represents the spatial construction of a psychological state below the level of the vanishing point. So that was an early precedence. But then a whole raft of artists designed public spaces have happened worldwide. This one by Daniel Buren in Paris. In Newcastle, we have the Blue Square by Thomas Heatherwick, where parts of the paving have seemingly been peeled up to form seats. And works by Mary Miss in New York and other locations throughout the United States, where, as you can see from these examples, artists are investigating the space below the ground plane, as well as working with the ground plane itself. And they're also creating places in which activities can happen. The work of Vito Conchi, which is a performance space, which also forms an island in a river in Graz in, in Austria. Now, artists are also adept at creating structures, of course, not just spaces. These tend to be artist-engineer collaborations. And in London, there are several artists design bridges 
at Paddington Basin. The example on the left, Thomas Heatherwick, is a bridge which unrolls as you move towards it. It obligingly <coughs> unfurls like a, a snail uncurling. That was the inspiration by the urn that the artist sought. In Melbourne, great example too of an artist design bridge, the work of Sonia Labour, David Chesworth and Simeon Nelson, which I had the pleasure of seeing very recently, where space is created through sound as well as through the linearity of the walk. Uh, it was explained to me that it's unfortunately fallen between the ownerships maintenance-wise, although the sound is working beautifully and the sound is of the tongues, the languages and chants and songs of people from Commonwealth countries who have settled in, in Australia. So art integrated into art architecture. Now artists' choice of their collaborators is of course key in relation to spaces, structures and not least architectural commissions. Early involvement is key because it maximizes both possibilities for artists, but also maximizes budgets. A very beautiful recent example of an architect having the generosity to give great spaces to artists is the work of Snow Hetter in Oslo, the new opera house, where we see examples by Olafur Eliasson, Pei White, and Monica Bonvicini, amongst other artists who have created spaces and sculptures and surfaces within that building. The next few examples are works that I have commissioned over the last 20 or so years, which have been integrated into architecture, which is a field I've, I've explored extensively. At St. John's College in Oxford, we worked with a painter who worked in glass, Alex Beloshenko, with the jewelry designer, Wendy Ramshaw, who never made anything larger than a brooch, before. This is one of a number of examples where I've invited jewelers to make work. And in Tokyo, one of six commissions which I integrated into a new building uh, for Mitsubishi in Marinucci. This too was a first for the artist, Susanna Heron's first work in glass. In London, in the Docklands Light Railway program, which we've led. Michael Craig Martin made his first work in ceramic, very celebrated artist, using cladding material for the station. And near London's Piccadilly for the Crown Estate, we commissioned a Swiss artist to work with the architects, Dixon Jones, and the artist here responded to the, the mirrored canopy above the walkway and created this light and glass wall which is animated by a four minutes computer program. Possibly the most or one of the most controversial commissions that I've ever had the privilege to lead has been for the Church of St. Martin in the Fields. This was integrating a new window into a 300 year old building, being refurbished by the architects Eric Parry Associates I was appointed as the art consultant, wrote a strategy, and this is the largest of the commissions for the church, some of which are temporary. It was an invited competition. Shirazi Hujuri, an Iranian artist, won the commission. Um, it, that was when the controversy arose. I'll just flick on. That was her first design uh, that was accepted by the art panel um, the church, however, saw this as being a, a whirling pit and rejected it. And we invited the artist to submit a second design, which is the integrated work you see here. The reason it was so controversial, the artist had never worked in glass before. Um, she happened to be Iranian. She was a Sufi. Um, I invited her to collaborate with uh, a glass studio in Munich and once it was installed, it was very widely recognized and celebrated. And people come to the church just to see the window. So artists' work that <clears throat> explores 
the use of light, sound, and interaction in relation to public space, there are a growing strand of activity, and one could argue, are these controversial? Do they raise big issues? Um, possibly not as much as sculpture, for example. But cities internationally are developing light programs. Geneva, Paris, Turin, Sydney, of course, later this month, Durham, Glasgow, and so forth, are all hosting light festivals. The cultural significance of light as a symbol of renewal is, of course, worldwide, and many cultures celebrate it, as the Diwali Light Festival, for example. Light as an art me medium has particularly enjoyed a resurgence um, since the advent, of course, of low energy LEDs, and it gives great scope for artists' collaboration with lighting engineers. But it has that capacity to make the familiar strange, um, whether it's through static light, whether it's through scrolling texts, like this work by Jenny Holzer, or the very discreet work which you discover, the lighting of drains in, in London by Susan Collins, literally interacting with the viewer in the work of Raphael Lozano Hemmer, or interacting through one's mobile phone in Nean Kulkani's work, you are invited to use your mobile phone to choose the color of the lighting of this metro bridge. So you can control what happens. I think there's a no-go area on red and green. <clears throat> the monuments and the memorial re revisited are, of course, historical public art forms, undergoing rich reinvestigation by artists. The monument, of course, means to warn. It's from the Latin monere. Now, playing with the historical setting, the plinth, I'd like to mention the fourth plinth program in London. The plinth, of course, was long discarded as a prop for sculpture by both Rodin and Henry Moore. But this is the setting for a really imaginative program. This has been going on since 2000 instigated by the Royal Society of Arts and now curated by the Mayor's Office, the Greater London Authority. The fourth plinth project was launched with this Mark Wallinger, Commission Echo Homo, which of course introduced the whole idea of the meaning of the millennium, which many people didn't recognize. And Mark Wallinger, I have to say, is one of the UK's most exciting conceptual artists working today. The selection procedure for the fourth plinth program, uh, it has a selection panel. Um, there's a long list created, a short list, and finally a selection of two schemes at any one time following the public exhibition of maquettes, which is typically held at either the National Gallery or St. Martin in the Fields Church. And these are shown and public comment is invited and indeed votes, um, but the public vote does not control the choice of uh, the selected artists, such as democracy. Uh, we see here the work by Rachel Whitreed, who chose to cast the plinth on itself, and Mark Quinn, with his choice of his friend, the artist Alison Lapper, who was um, born with no arms and short truncated legs. Mark Quinn thought he'd chosen the only uh, statue of a disabled person in London, but then he looked up and saw Nelson with his one eye and one arm and realized he didn't have far to look, <laughs> and so on. So there have been a number of such interventions on the fourth plinth. Um, fairly recent one was by Anthony Gormley called One and Other, whereby the public were invited to apply to be on the plinth for one hour at a time. So you or I or anybody could apply through a website and do anything they wanted, as long as it wasn't illegal, um, to be on the plinth. And some people would just simply sit or sleep or declaim, recite poetry, knit, you know, a variety of activities. Um, very interesting range of responses. Of course, the kit around the plinths to ensure that people didn't leap to their deaths um, was considerable. 
Um, so there was a lot of uh, hardware connected with it. But nevertheless, it was an important stroke for de democracy. Recently, we've had the Inko Shonibari ship in a bottle, which punned on the victory ship, Nelson ship, but replaced the flags with tribal patterns. And currently, we have Elm Green and Drag set there. And next, there'll be Katerina Fritsch, which, of course, is the French symbol, the cockerel, which would be one in the eye for Nelson. Now, any, I must, must say, any one of these installations will have cost more than the Patricia Piccinini Skyway. So I know that there's always a Ferrari around the budgets for public art, almost inevitably, um, but there is a cost involved, and given the scale of ambition and the cultural importance of such temporary projects, we all, I believe, in this audience know the arguments to defend such work. Now, the memorial, of course, has also been a, a really rich strand. Canberra is a city of memorials, as London is. One of the greatest influences on contemporary artists has been the Vietnam Veterans Memorial by Maya Lin. She was taught by Richard Serra. <clears throat> the fact it's cut into the ground, of course, is the opposite of this, of the Washington Memorial, which rises above it in a traditional manner. And it is the highly reflective surface, which, of course, is key to this work, whereby the viewers images are mingled with the names of the dead. It was controversial in its minimalism, um, so much so that uh, there was a further sculpture commissioned by Frederick Hart, which was much more traditional. And through observation, and uh, I've visited this city three times now, and I find that it is the Maya Lin work which attracts people and really attracts an emotional response and a long-term response, whereas people will simply take a picture of this and then move quickly on. So it's the power of the, the time base of Maya Lin's work which, which is so effective. The Holocaust, too, of course, has generated, understandably, some very effective and controversial works. Here, Jochen Gertz, made this piece on the edge of Hamburg in Germany, and his proposal was to lower this minimal lead column every few months into the ground and meanwhile invite the public to inscribe their initials against the acts of atrocity in the Holocaust. And you see it on the right as it was um, shortly before it finally disappeared. It is still there, um, but it has disappeared underground. Inevitably, it attracted some neo-fascist graffiti, so the, the surface itself became like a palimpsest of responses. In Documenta last year, Janet Cardiff and George Burris Miller with their Alter Bahnhof video walk, this was designed for the old station in Castle and takes us on a journey through the station to platform 13 from which Jews were deported to camps. And this fuses realities, past and present, conflate. It was a very affecting artwork. In Norway, the burning of 71 witches in the north of the country is commemorated in an artwork by Louise Bourgeois within a pavilion by Peter Zumthor. This living flame within the chair by Bourgeois indicates the deaths. And at the Tower of London, um, my office commissioned Brian Catling to design a memorial to mark the site of execution of the royal heads and courtiers who lost their lives in that site. The commoners were buried outside the site. In Hyde Park, a group of artists marked the 10th anniversary of the death of their friend, the pyrotechnics artist Stephen Cripps, in a work in ice, which lasted only 24 hours. Also in Hyde Park, the London 7th of July bombings on the Tuban buses in which 52 people died and many more were injured is marked in a memorial by Carmody Groek, advised by Anthony Gormley. 
I was advisor to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport for this work. And finally, a very powerful arts work by Steve McQueen, where servicemen and women killed in the Iraq war commemorated in a set of postage stamps. McQueen was the official war artist. The Royal Mail would not sanction the release of these stamps. Finally, the strand of participatory art running through all these previous sections indeed. This, of course, is nothing new. Since the 60s, as I mentioned earlier, uh, community arts, situationism, and other movements, artists were taking to the streets and decommodifying art. An artist, Mel Eucalys, has been working with New York City's sanitation department for over 30 years, and her first work took 18 months and involved shaking the hands of two and a half thousand sanitation workers and thanking them for keeping New York alive. She went on to make a series of works from detritus extrapolated from rubbish. Much more recently, Vic Munez has worked with communities in Rio, also creating amazing public arts works from rubbish taking as his starting point famous icons from the history of art, including this death of Mara. In Co the city of Coventry, um, I commissioned Jochen Gertz, he of the Disappearing Memorial, uh, to create a public bench which engages the public in its creation and appropriation, whereby any body in Coventry can have their name and that of a chosen other person engraved on a plaque and set on the back of the bench. The only vandalism has been some young couples who subsequently broken up and wanted to remove their plaques from <laughs> public view. Gertz also in the city created the Future Monument, which was much more controversial. Now in this work, of course, Future Monument, monuments are about the past, not the future, but this one, asked immigrant communities to name their past enemies as their friends. So it was an act of reconciliation. There were many immigrant communities within Coventry, and to qualify for a plaque, uh, there had to be at least 40 subscribers. So you see here Gertz being helped by his many assistants, including local art students, liaising with those immigrant communities. Whilst the work was being made, 9-11 uh, happened and the city council cancelled the project because they were afraid that would, it would elicit racial hatred. And it was the artist who convinced the city council to reinstate the peace and he made a passionate speech about democracy and the councillors agreed to reinstate it and not cancel it again and that is what what happened. And last in this section, Jeremy Della in 2001 recreated the miners' strike which took place in 1984, the so-called Battle of Orgreave, which was a police cavalry charge through the, through the village of Orgreave. And Della created a large-scale performance reenacting this confrontation between the police and the striking miners. It was commissioned by Art Angel. It involved 800 or more people, including former miners, a few former policemen, and some battle reenactment societies. So was this reopening old wounds, or was it a project which sought closure? One could argue it was both those things, but it was certainly a work which was participatory art par excellence. And then to finish, I'd like to mention um, one project which is completed uh, by modus operandi. It's complete and yet it's incomplete, as some such projects are, and it's imperfect. It's a strategy-led project, and it involved uh, creating not just a strategy, but working closely with a very large steering group of BBC and external stakeholders, and working closely with the architects McCormack, Jameson, Pritchard. We sought to look back at Reith's principles of why the BBC was founded, which was to inform, educate, and entertain. 
and to redefine public art as something which was on site, off site, and online and on air. And the strands of the programme you see here permanence, temporary artists, engagement projects, and education and community projects. This is the site, it's in the heart of London, and it is indeed a partially refurbishment project and new build. This is the, that's the 1930s listed grade two wing. This is all new build as this is, and that is a grade one listed church by John Nash. And Oxford Circus is about there. This is Portland Place. The Royal Institute of British Architects is up there. So it's an important site. Um, there was a notional percent for art budget, which didn't rise with the cost of the building. Um, it was started in 2001, only very recently finished and will be opened by the Queen in June. The building budget has exceeded its startup budget many times over. The original architects were fired and the building was completed by executive architects. The permanent commissions, of which there are just three, have a deliberately light touch. And you see here an early CGI of the project, which has an artist design place here, new lighting of all souls, and a sculpture which emerges and indeed enters the building, which is based on an inversion of this spire and forms a trilogy with the radio mast and, and the spire behind it. So we ran three concurrent international competitions to ensure that three artists who were selected did not cancel each other out. I should say that when we were appointed, there was still intended to be traffic running through this space, but it was the artist's winning design that made the case for it to be pedestrianized. That shows you the lighting projects and the sculpture. The sculpture itself is um, dedicated to news journalists killed on location. That was not its original intention, but when the BBC agreed this work, they were so moved by it, and the poem entitled Breathing by Jama Plentz, the artist, that they asked if it could be dedicated to news journalists, and that is what happened. And whilst the building was being refurbished, there were a series of artists' wraps, and there were Videos made both outside the building. This one was made by Catherine Yass with a camera suspended from a remote controlled helicopter. And the whole project was documented by John Riddy architecturally and by Nick Danziger in terms of the people involved in the project. So these temporary works are featured within the building. We also worked with school students and university students throughout the scheme. One of the temporary commissions was by Rachel Whiteread. We invited her to look at room 101, which was to be demolished, and indeed was the inspiration for George Orwell's room 101 in his novel 1984. So he used to work for the BBC um, during the Second World War. Rachel Whiteread chose to cast the whole room, uh, which is the sculpture you see here, and it was shown for a year in the Victoria and Albert's cast courts. And then finally with the BBC, the public space by Mark Pimlot has just been revealed. It imagines that you're walking on part of the world and that the BBC through its world service reaches out internationally to places both extremely known and very unknown. So there's a juxtaposition of place names, but also sounds that emerge from the paving and lights that come into play at night. And then finally one image, um, or two images rather, of the Radcliffe Observatory Quarter project mentioned in the introduction. This is a comparatively new project. It was launched in February this year. For the University of Oxford, this is their big flagship project, a 12-acre site where there are new and refurbished buildings I've written the public art strategy, and we have started to appoint artists, starting with a site-wide artist, to consider the whole public realm. 
and this will be followed by commissions for individual buildings by further artists for mathematics, humanities, school of government, and so forth. And that is the site. So you see here, this is an existing 18th century hospital building where humanities, philosophy, and theology are based. That's a new health building, School of Government by Herzog and de Maron, uh, mathematics around here. This is an observatory where we've been holding temporary installations by artists. And this should be the new humanities building when funds are raised for that to take place. It was launched by the vice chancellor um, and Nick Sorota, the director of the Tate, and Shira West, the head of humanities, and me, and has had enormous amount of support so far within the university. So are there any conclusions to this project? Not, none as yet. The site-wide artist Simon Periton has started to investigate his concept, the alchemical tree, working with the Bodleian Library. He's looking at imagery of al alchemical trees that will inform the approach he takes to a central sculpture, but also outlying elements um, within the Radcliffe site. And that is as far as we have reached with this particular project, and it will unfold over the next eight to 10 years. That is as long as some public art projects take. So the role of the curator in this process is not just one of initial visionary and curator and producer, but also one who is informally involved in contracts in advising the client, but advising the artist and the subcontractor in all the aspects of public art today, however controversial, and not least liaising with the media, which is how I started my day today. <laughs> so I'd like to leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. gentlemen, Vivian is happy to take some questions. I'd like to take this opportunity before I leave to thank you. Um, absolutely uh, mesmerising um, presentation tonight and I know you will enjoy hopefully the short time you have in Canberra to see some of our amazing uh, works of uh, public works of art. Um, but I know this, the questions will need to be managed. Please wait for the microphone. Um, I'll take this opportunity to thank you because I have to Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, look, I wanted to suggest something controversial. I've been commissioning art for 25 years and have seen its enormous growth and change to a point that it's a very exciting field to be in now compared to two or three decades ago. But I wanted to ask you what you think of the notion that sculpture could eclipse painting as the dominant 21st century art form. You know, we live in such a screen-based, two-dimensional world, and and I don't know whether I look at the the, the profession through my own professional sun, you know, rose-coloured coloured glasses. But I do have this this idea that we're moving into a, a realm where you describe the diversity of of, of artistic <coughs> interventions in public art that are particularly sculptural, sculpturally based, and I'd just be interested in your response to that, <laughs> that bold and controversial idea. Well, I did self-admittedly focus more on sculpture and three-dimensional art forms because of the nature of this conference. Um, but what I've found is that it's just a rich field per se at the moment. I don't find that perhaps sculpture is, is any, more, any stronger than painting, what I'm finding is that sculptors can also make films and create the most amazing projections, and equally painters can create installations. So I think the ability to transcend two dimensions and three dimensions is something that 
that I really enjoy. That's not to say that every artist has to do that, um, but I don't feel that there's a prevalent art form particularly. Hi, Vivian. Thank you very much for that as well. Um, I was curious when you were saying about what is beautiful um, sculptures um, and who is, who is the eye of the beholder sort of thing. Is the, is the beauty of a sculpture that is ugly uh, about creating controversy? I'm not quite sure I caught all that, but I caught beauty and <laughs> sculpture. And I'm just going to get a bit closer. Um, I was mm. just uh, querying about when you mentioned beauty, um, beauty yeah. um, and that sculptures or artworks should be commissioned with beautiful intents. Mm. Um, but is beauty ab also about creating that controversy and having that um, dialogue then between the public <clears> and the <throat> artists? I take your points, and I think that beauty can be extremely controversial. <laughs> and beauty, as is famously said, is in the eye of the beholder. So what is beautiful to one person can be quite ugly to another, of course. And that's why the field of public art is so riven with different opinions that we all love to enjoy different reactions to pieces out there. And yeah, I think to keep the notion of beauty in the frame is something that I believe in. Because I, do, I, I believe in art's capacity to attract contemplation and wonder, as well as to astonish and, and to outrage us and to challenge us. So yes, I'd like to keep beauty in the frame, but I realize that it may be ugly to some people. <laughs> it's all a question of subjectivity and objectivity. Uh, you mentioned about the, the problematic notion of public art. I also, you know, by, for me, uh, all art, uh, is by nature is public art because in the mm. after you moment you leave at the studio mm. is in the uh, realm of the public. So yeah. for you, I mean, your I like to hear about your view of how we define the public art mm. because it's belong mm. to mm. public possession is mm. public art or because in the mm. sphere of the public. <clears throat> it's a really interesting question, and I would have gone more into it had there been more time. Um, public arts, you know, some people simply define it as art beyond the gallery. You know, anything, i.e. anything you haven't chosen to see, <laughs> art you stumble across, you, art you come across. And that is one way of looking at it. But of course, in recent years, uh, particularly curators in public galleries are saying, but actually public galleries are also the public realm. You know, if collections are free, is this not also public art because it's public space? It might have a roof over it. Um, but I think there is some sort of borderline fuzzy, though it may be somewhere between art you have chosen to see and is curated in a zone like a sculpture park um, or garden and art you really haven't chosen to see. So I think it's that the fuzzy zone that I'm quite interested in. But also how public, you know, as I mentioned, public space is an op oxymoron, some people feel. Some people feel that public art is an oxymoron as well. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't just go as far as to say that. <laughs> but there are degrees of public space, as, as we're all aware. You can say, you know, you can argue that a school or a hospital is not strictly speaking or prison come to that matter, public space. They're public for certain communities or sectors. <laughs>